then, in 1967, I became president of the New England Conservatory. And those were, as many of us might remember, were very difficult um, years. Gunther Schuller's appointment as president of the New England Conservatory of Music happened in the era of the assassinations of John F. Kennedy, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., and Robert F. Kennedy, and the shooting by National Guard troops of four students at Kent State University in an attempt to restore order after students rioted over the war in Vietnam and Cambodia. Sarah Caldwell, who was very active in Boston, even before I got to Boston in 1967, worked it out to get me a commission to write an opera. I had, as a child in Germany, had read several times a grim fairy tale, uh, which is called in old German, The Fisherman in Zinfru, uh, The Fisherman and His Wife. Since the commission was for an opera for children, The Fisherman and His Wife was Schuller's first choice. That's how that commission came about, and one of the problems at the time in my writing that was that I was extraordinarily busy at the conservatory working, you know, 18, 19 hours a day trying to save the damn place because it had gone bankrupt financially and even educationally. And also, I as a high school dropout, what the hell did I know about running a conservatory? You know, higher education, university, conservatory, I didn't know anything. I, I barely knew the difference between a graduate degree and an undergraduate degree. So I'm just explaining how busy I was there. Also, I was getting very famous as a conductor, and I was conducting at the San Francisco Opera for, you know, two months, and then I was conducting in Germany and in England and so on. All of this was going on, and I said to myself, when am I going to write this opera? And some kind of a date had been set for 1970. The premiere was set for May the 21st. I started work on this, finally, and, uh, it's, and it turned out to be an opera for a small orchestra, 35-piece orchestra, which had jazz instruments in it, uh, because uh, by that time I had been involved with jazz for almost 20 years. The ladies' committee had this idea of presenting this not only on television eventually, but to tour it and in a way like children's concerts, for children's concerts. And that was very successful, and Sarah did tour the opera for a number of years after the premiere. There was one major problem to writing an opera on The Fisherman and His Wife. Because in the original story, it only takes about four pages in any book, and there's hardly any text. The only text is what the fisherman says to the fish. She says she wants a cottage with a garden and a bed. Asking for ever greater wishes for his wife when one of her first requests is just to have a nicer house. You know, I made it kind of a simple music. When she, for example, requests to have a castle, I, I wrote kind of a music that would be royal and, and, and uh, uh, kind of pompous too. Who has these grandiose ideas of one in the end. I want to be queen. She wants to be king. really uh, outrageous demands. As the fish gets more and more irritated with these increasing wishes of the fisherman, not only does he get uh, kind of upset, but the water around him rises in each scene so that at the end it's, a, it's practically a hurricane when, when the fish is really furious with these increasing demands. There were a lot more notes because of the turbulence of the storm, this hurricane. I wrote all this crazy music, you know, especially in the percussion and some thunderstorms and lightning and whatnot. And the magic fish keeps granting them, and finally at the end, he has enough of this, and uh, 
both of them, the fisherman and his wife, are reduced to the lowly hovel that they started out with 13 scenes earlier. Getting back to what was the major problem, the text was either so non-existent or when it did exist, it was always the same line by the fish and by the fisherman. He's just asking for more and the only difference is what it is that he's asking for. So I said, I, I can't make an opera out of this and I love this thing so I went to my friend John Updike and asked him whether he had time and any inclination to do a little opera libretto. It wasn't going to be long. And by God, he said yes. I, I was sure that I was going to get a quick rejection. You know, I've just written couples and I've, you know, I'm busy with writing all my books and reviews for the New Yorker and I can't do it. But he did. In this natural life, is stranger than a man and wife. And he wrote the most wonderful, imaginative, poetic libretto. The fish that talks is very... A terrible thing happened. Suddenly, my wife shows me a little article in the Boston Globe that the performance date of the opera has been advanced by two weeks. Sarah Caldwell, she didn't tell me, she didn't have the decency to, to inform me of this. Oh, by the way, Gunther, can you, you know, and then asking, can you do it, can you finish it two weeks earlier? Oh, I was, I was just outraged. And also because in those two weeks, one of those weeks, I was supposed to conduct in Zagreb, Yugoslavia. I knew I was going to make the opera because I was going to finish it before Zagreb. Uh, I thought I could do that and then, and then come back from Zagreb and still have three or four or five days, whatever it was, to rehearse the opera and then uh, put it on. Well, this just blew my mind. And, I, and so I had to call Zagreb and cancel. This is the only time I've ever broken a contract. I owe that to dear Sarah. She, she was an incredible lady, and, and she has, you know, she's contributed enormously to our, to our opera scene in the United States as one of the best. But she had this other side, and I guess this was part of that, that she just either forgot or didn't care uh, uh, to check with me. I mean, any other human being I know would have said, hey, Gunther, do you think you could do it a little bit earlier? Meister Schuller had a significant portion of the opera still to be composed. And suddenly, it's five days before the premiere, we still have to rehearse the thing. We had been rehearsing those parts that were ready. But at that point, I still had three scenes to write. I sat at that table in the dining room and composed, and now you can call this a binge, I did not sleep at all for five days and nights. I just worked through and through. And I didn't know whether I was going to make it. When you write music, you, of course, write the score. And then you have to, uh, in my case, I wrote it in a sort of notebook in, in a short form. Um, but then you have to write it out in a full score for the, all the, each instrument. And then after that, copyists have to go to work to copy the parts so the music can be played by living musicians. So, um, and at that point, I decided my favorite copyist, a fellow named Donald Stewart, who had been my copyist for 20 years, and he knew my music, my style, the way I wanted the music copied and all of that. And he, I, he lived in New York. I brought him to Boston and I told him to bring with him three or four of his best copyist friends. And by the way, I paid for all of this. Sarah did not, or the committee. I put them up in a hotel which is now gone, but it's just about a quarter of a mile from here, a kind of motel hotel. I put them, all five of them up, 
there. And what now happened? As I finished a page of score, my secretary or my wife went down to the motel, gave it to Don Stewart, and he then duplicated it and, and, and then divided up the parts like somebody did the flute and oboe and clarinet parts, somebody else did brass parts, some of them did jazz parts. So that way they kept up with my composing. So it was a race between, you know, who, who, who was going to write faster because I, I had to keep ahead of them. Because, you know, five copyists can probably take three or four pages of a score and deal with it in a few hours. I didn't know whether I could be ready for them when the next batch had to be delivered to them. Well, that went on for these uh, five days and five nights. Now, the final catastrophic aspect of this was that I think it was two days before the premiere. Were, were, that, that was the day of the Kent State killings. As a result of the National Guard having killed four students at Kent State in an attempt to control rioting, outbursts had now started in many other cities, including Boston. And this whole town and the whole United States went crazy. And, you know, there were burnings of buildings and smashing windows and everything went crazy. I finished at five o'clock of, of the day of the premiere having rehearsed all the previous music before that. But I finished the 13th scene and the ending of the opera, which has a kind of a uh, coda or epilogue in it, like, like uh, Don Giovanni or Mozart has, is where there's a happy ending, you know. And I finished at 5 a.m. And I hadn't slept for five days and five nights. And I had a, and there was a rehearsal at 11 o'clock, the premiere of the opera was in the afternoon, and I stayed up more and conducted the premiere. So I played uh, saxophone and clarinet in that, and uh, again, there was some thought about not doing it at all because of all of the stuff that was going on, the upheaval and everything. I think all the musicians and everybody wanted to continue, wanted to perform. Uh, Maybe because we wanted to see how the work ended. We didn't. We didn't know Gunther was writing this thing, or the parts at least were being copied, while we were premiering the thing. And I and and the premiere actually was a children's matinee. It wasn't an evening performance. It was a children's matinee, and uh, I can remember Harvey Phillips, big rotund guy that he was, crawling around in the pit, putting parts on stands because the copyists was in the orchestra room copying parts. And this is, you know, the next act is coming up. Oh, okay, here this is, now we play this. <laughs> it was great. It was great, though. To make matters even worse, the killings had occurred, the town was going crazy, and my conservatory students were all in rebellion of one kind or another. And I'm the president. I have to deal. Donald Harris, my vice president, calls me, you know, here at the house and then later at the theater. Hey, Gunther, can't you cancel the opera? <laughs> he said, you know, I mean, they, you know, they, I think they're going to burn up the building or do something crazy or the dormitory. You know, these kids are wild. And I said, Jesus, I, I cannot cancel this. Uh, but uh, look, I'll come down after the opera and tell everyone to hang in there, go into Jordan Hall, and just wait for me. Well, I rushed over to the Jordan Hall, or Brown Hall Conservatory, and I made a 35-minute speech. Yeah, he, he, he did have to, to, to stand in front of the faculty and the students to talk about what the conservatory's role could be in all of this. And I think the message, as I remember it, was that we, we would be doing a better service by continuing to do what we did to the best. I mean, we could dedicate every performance, we could, you know, we could do those kinds of things. But as far as a, a strike and as far as closing down the school, uh, while I'm, I know it was discussed and there were probably a couple of days where classes were suspended and all of that. And there was a time when, again, the conservatory was needing to raise money. And so the concern might well have been, and again, I 
wouldn't have been necessarily privy to these conversations, but you know, I know that they were probably courting some fairly well-to-do donors. And if, if they closed the school down and went into a kind of protest mode, maybe those donors would walk, walk away. And I'm sure we're probably uh, very aware of that, that possibility. Essentially, what I said was, look, you're all my charges. I love you all. I've been working hard with you uh, all through you know, your tenure here. We are musicians. I don't think we are the best people to go out and start marching in the streets with placards, although that's, that's a pretty benign option. But we are certainly shouldn't be uh, burning down buildings, uh, uh, trashing cars, and you know, doing all kinds of destructive things. And in Boston, that had already started at Harvard and, and all the, especially the schools, Boston University. And, you know, the police were all out trying to calm all this down and to not very much success. I said, this is not for us to do. We are musicians. Let's do what we do best. Let's make music. And I, and I went on, uh, you know, as to what I meant by that. Here's what we should do. We should keep this concert. I'm going to cancel commencement. I can't help it. You'll get some kind of grade somehow, but there'll be no commencement. We cannot celebrate commencement when these things are going on. Um, and I, I know that you don't want to study exams now also, I mean, under these conditions. I said, what we should do is keep the conservatory open and have music going on around the clock, 24 hours, so that anybody at any time 4.01 a.m. can come to this conservatory, and in Jordan Hall and in Brown Hall, there will be concerts going on. It might be a jazz concert, it might be an early music concert, it might be a rock, rock and roll concert, uh, who knows, whatever it is. And um, Donald Harris and I got on the phone still that same day. So I called up all these different music groups that I knew about, um, some of them associated with the other universities and uh, cons conservatory and so on, but also independent groups, contemporary music groups, uh, dance groups, all kinds of things. And that started the, the next day. And uh, it went on for three weeks. I was here for one of those concerts. My name is Jack Borden. I was here with a crew from WBZ-TV in Boston and with other members of the Boston Press Corps to interview a member of the audience, but a member of the audience who was also an official of the Nixon administration as to his reaction to the planned withdrawal of U.S. troops from Cambodia. When the applause had died down, Gunther turned to the gentlemen and ladies of the press and said, I have no illusions. I know you weren't here for the music. But I ask you, please come back here soon and often to acquaint the public with the excellence in music that emanates from our conservatory. And in the meantime, ponder this. What kind of a world would we be living in if it were a world without music? For three weeks, we had music around the clock there, which was one of the most wonderful, beautiful things that I can recall in my that ever happened in my, my life. To feed my nose the perfume of fish What would we wish with a wish?